Hi, my name is John Sue Esser, and I am a rising junior at Dickinson College, majoring in biochemistry and molecular biology. I spent this past summer as an intern for the Cosgrove Lab at Cornell University as a part of the CUSP program within the CENNET Consortium. Before I arrived at this lab, I did not know about the CENNET Consortium or what senescence was. But now, after a summer reading senescence papers, shadowing experiments in the lab, and investigating patterns in senescence using computer programming, I understand how interesting and significant this consortium is. The Cellular Senescence Network was established to characterize the heterogeneity of senescent cells in 18 tissues at the single cell resolution using animal models at various stages of health across the body and across the lifespan. The general goal of the labs I shadowed this summer were to map senescence in epithelial cells and skeletal muscle, endometrial tissues, ovarian tissues, and oviduct tissues. My specific goal was an investigation using computer programs such as RStudio to graph and analyze and data and find senescent scores for epithelial tissues in endometrial tissues compared with gene lists consisting of known SESPs and biomarkers. Biomarkers of senescence are important because they help to detect senescent cells and show that senescent cells accumulate at sites of aging associated diseases in each tissues. Senescence associated secretory phenotypes or SASPs as I said earlier, are a component of the senescent phenotype that have evolved to signal the presence of senescent cells to the immune system and promote their elimination. But when senescent cells persist, their SASP becomes detrimental. To provide a quick timeline for my summer, I first started by reading scientific papers and journals, researching and learning about senescence in the SenNet Consortium. I then started learning the coding language R through online tutorials. R is used for data analysis and helped me to generate UMAPs, feature plots, and viral plots regarding senescence expression in ovarian epithelial cells. While learning R, I also spent my time shadowing grad students in the lab during various procedures and asking questions about how each procedure was connected to senescence. Throughout the summer, I also completed trainings on proper lab etiquette and familiarized myself with the setting. As an added benefit to the program, I was also able to attend scientific talks and presentations that other REU internships on campus were hosting. Before moving on to the background methods and results of my investigation, I wanted to provide a general background about senescence and some of what I learned. So senescence is characterized by the permanent proliferation arrest of cells. Senescence is known to contribute to impaired tissue regeneration, which can have positive effects, as well as chronic age-associated diseases, which can have negative effects. The three main phenotypes of senescent cells are that they enter permanent arrest of proliferation, become relatively resistant to cell death, and develop SESPs. It occurs in response to stressors such as telomere dysfunction, oncogene activation, persistent DNA damage, loss of P10, which is a tumor suppressor gene, and the accumulation of reactive oxygen species in tumors, as well as aging. The type of DNA damage that primarily causes senescence are nuclear DNA damage, which are DNA double strand breaks that activate the D DNA damage response pathway, or the DDR. Telomere dysfunction refers to how telomeres shorten after each round of DNA replication and lead to the induction of cellular senescence. An important note to make here about the possibility of preventing senescence due to telomere shortening is using an enzyme called telomerase to promote unlimited cell proliferation, which can also lead to negative impacts. So uh, looking at the benefits and detrimental impacts, some of the benefits, um, well, before that, I should say that SASPs include pro-inflammatory cytokines, growth factors, proteases, receptors, extracellular vesicles, bioactive lipids, extracellular matrix proteases, which can be potential biomarkers for senescence. An SASP favors proper tissue development, tissue repair, inhibition of cancer growth, and recruitment of immune cells. With assistance from SASPs, the presence of senescent cells is beneficial for normal development of tissues and morphogenesis, as well as tissue repair and inhibition of cancer growth. The negative effects, however, are that SASP persistence can generate chronic inflammation and contribute to aging related diseases and cancer. It can also lead to inflammaging, which is a pro-inflammatory condition characterized by high circulating levels of inflammatory molecules. Senescence also limits proliferation of stem and progenitor cells, which are crucial to cell health. Moving on to the next section on the slide, uh, looking at senolytics and senomorphics, which are two important avenues of possible treatment to eliminate senescent cells. 
Senolytics target senescent cells for elimination, whereas senomorphics modulate properties of senescent cells without eliminating them. Organisms already have an intrinsic senolytic system consisting of immunosurveillance against senescent cells. Due to a decline in immunosurveillance, senescent cells accumulate in aged and diseased tissues. This means that boosting the ability of the immune system to specifically eliminate senescent cells could result in clearance of senescent cells from tissues. For senomorphics, a way to keep cells alive while eliminating the negative impacts of senescence is by using tel telomeric antisense oligonucleotides to reduce DNA damage repair activation, levels of senescence markers, and SASP induction, which can in turn lead to improved homeostasis and increased lifespan. When comparing senomorphics and senolytics, senolytics are considered better because it eliminates the possibility of senescent cells going through mutations that can help those cells become senescent again or promote cancers and damaged cells. A downside to senolysis is that it gets rid of P16 expressing endothelial cells in aged organs, which have structural functions and can lead to other health problems. Now, moving on to the background of my small investigation for the summer, because I was looking at epithelial cells in the endometrium, tissue from the uterine horn would need to be collected for the specific data I analyzed. During some of the procedures I shadowed, different types of epithelial cells such as luminal epithelial and glandular epithelial cells were stained. The reason luminal and glandular epithelial cells were focused on in this lab is because those were the two cells that had Pax8 mRNA, and I'll go into the significance of that shortly. Um, the sample size for the data set I looked at included seven controls, seven early stage, seven mid stage, and three advanced stage mice samples. The UMAP I created consisted of 20 samples by 20,000 genes, and I'll, I will also present the UMAP shortly. Um, okay, so these two images on the left demonstrate the result of some of the staining experiments I shadowed during the summer. Trope 2 was used to stain luminol epithelial cells, and FOXA2 was used to stain the glandular epithelial cells. As seen in the figure, the luminal lines the outside of the tissue, whereas the glandular cells are suspended. The figure on the right demonstrates the presence of Pax8 exclusively in the luminal and glandular epithelium, and Pax8 is important because it is a unifying protein driving metastasis in ovarian tumors in mice that could be developed to treat ovarian cancer in the epithelium. For data collection, mouse models were used, more specifically the doxycycline injected mouse. With doxycycline, the proliferation of tumor cells are inhibited and the stop codon is removed, which allow the Cree factor to be transcribed, and this plays important roles in cell proliferation, differentiation, and adaptation. Going back to the time timeline of sample collection, there are samples taken from four time points. The first one is uh, the point of injection. The second, or the early stage, is from 30 to 50 days after injection. The mid stage is from 80 to 100 days after injection. And the most advanced samples are taken from about 120 to 150 days after injection. And um, the methods used for collecting this data include single cell RNA sequencing. In order to do this, euthanization of the mice and dissection of the uterus was necessary. I was able to shadow many of these dissections and perform one myself during the summer. Then the collected uterine tissues were dissociated by mincing the tissues, moving them through many washes and placing them in solutions to keep the cells alive. Afterwards, single cells are dropped and loaded with beads and the next gen sequencing with 10X technology is completed. It should be noted, however, that the 10X approach is a platform technology that generates RNA sequencing libraries from individual cells and the sequencing itself is done on another instrument. Um, the preparation of the data that was done before I arrived at this lab consisted of sequencing the outputs, aligning the results with, no with the known mass genome, reading count matrices into R, and finally at the end, completing a principal component analysis and quality control of the results. So this is the UMAP that was produced using RStudio. And the UMAP consists of 20 samples uh, by 20,000 genes and condenses all of that data into two axes. It's a graph that displays the data and demonstrates patterns within the types of tissues and which cells were present in those tissues. And it's able to retain some, but not all of the data from that set. Um, on the right, some of the biomarkers that are known to be connected to senescence are listed, but I've chosen to just focus on four of them. And I chose CDKN2A, CDKN1A, TGFB1, and MMP3, 
Because of the variety of ways it shows how the feature plots derived from the UMAP are connected to the violin plots produced from this data. So now I have my feature plots and violin plots. Um, the first gene I looked at was CVKN2A, which is the cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor 2A, and it plays a significant role in regulating cell cycle progression and cellular senescence by encoding for two important suppressor proteins, P16 INK4A and P14 ARF. These proteins are involved in controlling cell division, preventing uncontrolled growth, and promoting cellular senescence as a response to various stresses. And these are all of the violin plots, just so uh, the you can see how it's presented in like every tissue. Um, but I chose to focus on just three of them, which had like data of significance. So the feature plot shows that it is only present in the luminal epithelium and the epiprogenitor tissue, and seems to get stronger in more advanced stages. So as time goes on. And there's a lot of CVK and 2A expression in luminal, which is why my goal for the summer was to do the clustering and senescence scoring using R. These graphs are very significant because they are fulfilling my overall goal for the summer, which was identifying which tissue P16 is associated with and prove that it is not found in every tissue, thus revealing that not all markers are addressed in the same cells and that P16, despite how common it is, isn't universal. And it ultimately shows that senescence is multifaceted. Um, moving on to the next gene. So CVKN1A is a gene that codes for the P21 protein and also plays a critical role in regulating the cell cycle, DNA repair, and cellular responses to stress, including cellular senescence. The P21 protein is a key player in controlling cell division and maintaining cellular integrity. And um, I wanted to include all of the CDK and 1A feature plots and violin plots because this gene is present in almost all of the tissues and displays different patterns across various stages, which uh, leads me to believe that the protein P21 can be considered a universal protein present in all tissues based on this data. Um, on to the next gene, TGFB1 stands for Transforming Growth Factor Beta 1 which is a multifunctional cytokine that plays a crucial role in cellular senescence similar to previous genes. And looking at the specific violin plots, uh, the final, uh, sorry, TGFB1 is only present in the lymphatic epithelium, vascular tissue, macrophages, and lymphocytes, which is an example of a cell type that is not present in all tissues, but only some. And it also seems, seems, according to the violin plots, that the time after injection doesn't affect the amount of cells found in that tissue. Um, the final gene I chose to look at was MMP3, or matrix metalloproteinase 3, which is an enzyme that plays a crucial role in remodeling the extracellular matrix. MMP3 is not directly implicated in senescence regulation like other genes or proteins. However, it does have implications for cellular senescence and age-related processes through its involvement in tissue remodeling and inflammation. And looking at the one significant violin plots, although MMP3 is a biomarker, since it is not directly involved in senescence regulation, very little is seen in different tissues and it is predominantly in the fibroblast. However, it seems that as time went on, the number of cells decreased, which is a different pattern from what is seen in other gene sets also alluding to how senescence is multifaceted and isn't the same in every tissue. And um, after all of my results, I also wanted to just go back and provide a brief snapshot of all the experiments I was able to shadow and lab procedures I learned about. I watched organoid, organoid formation procedures, including a collagenase dispase isolation, which consisted of organ collection and dissection, tissue digestion, and ended with a cytospin protocol, I also watched oviduct tissue and cell isolation, as well as learned about gel electrophoresis for genotyping, which consisted of preparing 2% agarose gel, adding the samples to the gel, and reading the gel. I also shadowed a genotyping PCR protocol to determine the genotypes of different mice samples, and this could be broken down into the tissue collection, DNA isolation from tissue, sample mix preparation, and finally running the PCR for DNA amplification. I also spent a majority of this summer learning R because I had no prior knowledge of coding or computer science, and it was an amazing introduction to understanding how computer programming could be applied to data analysis. This is how I was able to produce the UMAP, feature plots, and violin plots. Um, during the summer, I watched a lot of procedures surrounding organoid formation and collection, and I didn't know why organoids were so prevalent in the senescence labs. 
I learned that there were many reasons like the architectural similarity between live cells and organoids, which allowed researchers to study senescence in a more physiologically relevant context. And organoids can also incorporate multiple cell types and can show how different cell populations within a tissue are affected by senescence. Organoids are also useful since they can be maintained for a longer period of time than live cells. And another thing I wondered like while shadowing all these labs was what role stem cells played in this research and why they were so important. So stem cells can undergo senescence as well, which limits their regenerative potential and studying stem, stem cells by using organoids provides insights into how senescence affects tissue regeneration and overall organoid function. Additionally, stem and progenitor cells are key to maintaining homeostasis and organization following organ and tissue injury. This concludes my final presentation for the summer, and I just want to say thank you to all of the members of the Cosgrove Lab for always being so helpful, and especially thank you to Dr. Ben Cosgrove for providing guidance, and Lauren, Madeline, and Coulter for being so incredibly helpful with answering all of my questions allowing me to shadow their procedures and providing me with data and resources for this investigation. I also want to thank the CUSB program, Elizabeth, Kay, Melissa, and Natasha for helping put together such a wonderful program that changed how I view research and introduced the SendNet Consortium, which is by far the most interesting research avenue I've ever known. Thank you.